Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ian and Friends. I am Flow Bike Senior Editor Ian Dilly. And I am Michael Sheehan, Ian's friend. Today, we're going to give you a roundup of the weekend's action in cyclocross. We're going to look ahead to 2019 road season. It is shaping up. It gets underway in just under a week. And we're going to touch on the top news story of the week as well. The 90-year-old doper. Cheater. All right, let's get started. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that one. <laughs> Anyways, over the weekend, we saw the birth of a new cyclocross race. It was a university campus in Brussels. If you watched it on Flow Bikes, you saw it was a really, really phenomenal course. Extremely challenging, lots of tricky ruts, off camber, some really treacherous looking downhills. It was really good fun. In the women's race, Salen Alvarado really put on a master class. Yeah, this is a young rider from the Netherlands, technically still in the Esquire ranks, but racing with the elite women in the Deve Vey series. Um, just rode away from the field. Sanakant was putting up a strong chase until she had a really tough crash, uh, faded back to seventh. And Alvarado, yeah, we've been expecting big results from her all year, and she put it together for really what was the probably the biggest ride of her young career, um, likely until she does the under 23 world championships where she is for sure the odds on favorite to win. In the men's race, again. Yep, big news, exciting news. <laughs> Matthew Vanderpool uh, just stormed away with it. Toon Ertz, he was the best of the rest. Put on a really, really good ride. He is definitely, I'm sure, looking forward to the World Championships almost as much as Matthew Vanderpool is. And I do want to give a shout out to the Americans. Kerry Warner uh, did ride the steps, which was a unique display of his talent. Yeah, that was actually incredibly impressive. Toon Ertz attempted the feat as well, and it did not end as glamorously for Toon, but really, really cool show by Kerry Werner. And if you haven't caught the replay, certainly tune in. We have English commentary from Mr. Michael Sheehan and Johnny Sunt. A cyclocross is going to return to Flow Bikes uh, with the next round of the World Cups and, of course, the World Championships. All of the, those races are going to be available live and on demand to our Canadian viewers. Let's get into our 2019 road season. We're going to talk about three big stories that are not necessarily on everyone's radar to start the tour down under. In just about a week's time, we are going to see the World Tour calendar start up in Australia. One of the main features of the tour down under is the stage which ends at Wollonga Hill. It is the first time we see the road racers tackle an explosive finishing climb. I wouldn't quite call it a summit finish, but it is an extremely exciting test for the climbers to uh, see where their legs stand at the very beginning of the season. This hill has been dominated for the past five years by only one rider. That is, of course, Richie Port. He's won every edition since 2014. But Ian and I have been talking, and we are thinking that there may just be one rider who can take the Wollonga crown from Richie Port this year. Yeah, Michael Woods is certainly a rider to watch on this hill. Uh, finished third in his debut on Willonga Hill in 2017, his debut to the World Tour ranks. Really, and it's really a hill that is built for him, uh, similar to the Hall Climb. We saw him roar up at the World Championships. Um, short, steep. This is a guy who ran under a four minute mile in college and it's right within his uh, skill set as a bike racer. So we were kind of talking about this and then Mike Woods actually put on social media a uh, his training plan for the day, which was doing efforts up Wollonga. He is definitely thinking about it as well. You know, like I said, nobody has been able to match the pace that Richie Port just propels himself to the finish line at. If anyone can do it, I think it's Mike Woods. And I mean, not only is this the first big race of the season, but it's also going to kind of set the stage for the season moving forward. Richie Port moving to Trek Segafredo, obviously trying to impress his new team. And Michael Woods coming off the best season of his career, second at Liege, best on Liege, won a stage of the Welthaus fan, obviously on the podium of the World Championship. He is going to be one of the main riders to watch in 2019. Let's get into the Women's World Tour. We had 
big news coming in the transfer season for the Women's World Tour with two of the Titans joining forces, Marianne Voss and Ashley Moolman Passio. Marianne Voss finished this year's World Tour with incredible form, won four races in a row before starting her cyclocross season and has been dominating more or less the women's cyclocross season, leading the World Cup, won the last round of the World Cup in Zolder. But if there was one knock against her, it's that she has often been left alone when competing against the likes of Bulls Dolmans, uh, Mitchelton Scott, and Canyon Shran. This has certainly limited her ability to, you know, maybe win as many races and come back to the dominating form that she showed previously in her career. Ashley Mulman Paseo is one of the most phenomenal climbers in the women's peloton, one of the few riders who can hold the wheel of Anna Van der Breggen and Annemiek Van Vluten when they're on form. She was third at La Course, second overall at the Giro Rosa, and is no slouch in the Spring Classics as well, top 10 at nearly every Spring Classics in 2018, and uh, I think second at Flesh Wallon. So these two riders coming together has me incredibly excited and I think is setting us up for one of the best um, women's world tour seasons we're going to see in years. Yeah, definitely do keep an eye on this new, newly formed CCC Live team. Uh, Marianne Voss, of course, just one of the greatest uh, racers of all time in our sport. She just got a really, really powerful lieutenant. And you can tune in to the one of the first women's world tour races of the year. Cadell Evans Great Ocean Road Race will be broadcast live and on demand on flowbikes.com and the Flow Sports app. Let's move on to our third big storyline. The Wolfpack is thinning. Yeah, the Wolfpack uh, has thinned. We are in 2019 and the most winning team of the 2018 season has lost uh, two of their marquee riders. That is, of course, Nikki Terpstra and Fernando Gaviria. Fernando Gaviria, he left for UAE t Team Emirates amid the uh, quick step struggle to find a new title sponsor. Similarly, Nikki Terpstra seems to have found greener pastures at a pro continental team, Direct Energy. And we're kind of wondering how that is going to uh, work out for one of the greatest classics riders of the current crop. And I think dropping down that level to the Pro Continental, you don't have the same resources, you don't have the same support, and uh, Nikki Terpstra definitely won't have the same strong teammates back in the field when he goes on some, you know, 50 kilometer raid. Yeah, there is a major difference when you go into a race knowing that you are one of three guys on your team who can realistically win the race to having really that entire burden on your shoulders. It sometimes works out and it sometimes doesn't. I think that Direct Energy is really looking to have Nikki Terpstra take the entire team's level up a notch, which can definitely help if Terpstra is a strong leader that the entire team rallies behind. You know, they could really unearth some hidden talent that is on Direct Energy and it could uh, really propel the squad to a higher stature in the pro continental ranks. I know that they do have ambitions to go into the world tour. Uh, so that is one possibility, but it is going to be a lot of pressure on Nikki Terpstra's shoulders. Looking at what Quick Step has the new Dusanik Quick Step squad, they have shifted to the future generation. One exciting, exciting rider, of course, is Remco Evenepoel. He won the junior world uh, championships in both the individual time trial and the road race. And he is going to be beginning his season with the new Quick Step squad uh, down in South America. Yeah, this is a rider who has been dubbed, you know, <laughs> a lot of expectation cast on his shoulders as the next Eddie Merckx, the next cannibal of the Peloton. And the way we saw him ride at the World Championships, you know, <laughs> he is certainly living up to that title. One of the most incredible uh, performance we saw at the World Championships last year. But at the same time, this rider is only 18 years old. You know, is Patrick Leferbe, is Quick Step going to throw him straight into the Spring Classics? We'll see. He will be making his professional debut at the Vuelta al San Juan, another race that will be broadcast on Flow Bike. So we'll, we'll be covering that closely and seeing how he uh, performs in the pro ranks. I think he certainly has the talent from what we've seen in his racing. Yeah, the reputation that he has earned, he thoroughly deserves it. The young rider is just absolutely incredible. It was unlike anything we'd ever seen when we 
watched him in Innsbruck. Uh, so yeah, please do tune into Flow Bikes to catch his World Tour debut. And now let's go from a rider who is only 18 years old to a rider who is 90 years old. American Carl Grove, who was recently sanctioned by USADA for failing a drug test at the Masters National Championships in track where he set a world record. Carl tested positive for an anabolic substance, basically a steroid that was promoting muscle growth, um, trimming body fat. He actually received a public warning because it was later proven through testing that he was taking a supplement that was contaminated with this steroid without his knowledge. This substance was not on the labels of the supplement he was taking. Um, USADA also felt like he had eaten meat, which was <laughs> contaminated or potentially contaminated with the substance as well. Carl disclosed prior to taking the test that he had eaten meat the night before, and he had also passed a drug test just the day prior. Vice. So he goes in the 10th and he breaks a world record, which you probably know is really at that age, they call them world bests, um, because they're kind of hard to absolutely validate. Um, and he, they drug test him and he passes and everything's fine. Then he goes the next day and he sets another world record and they drug test him and they find some trace elements of an anabolic steroid. You know, the whole, you, you can read that through the mm -hmm. article. So you go, oh, wow, you know, what happened there? Um, so, you know, the backstory goes like, you know, the, the, the final parts of the story go like this. So he goes out after setting the first records and achieves his goal and he goes out with my wife was there supporting him. He is a family friend and, um, and his little support team and they go out to dinner and Carl gets this double liver dinner. <laughs> at some local diner, like totally true story, right? He, wait, he ate liver? Yeah, it's not beef. People are going to steak. Liver's worse. It's it's a bigger risk. Um, you know, the guy's ninety. This is what he grew up on, and that was his big reward dinner. So, but that is, I mean, the liver is like the body and the in 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 animals. That's where, yeah, like all the byproduct that you can't process goes. So, absolutely, yeah. it's the absolute place. And I, and I literally. 10 years ago, I had warned him against eating it. Wow. So it, what Kathy and I do do, so that's, so he goes and eats that. The other problem is he takes a lot of supplements and Kathy is my wife. So she works with him too. We both help him. She's a coach and, and we both just help him along. We don't want to structure his training because then he gets too serious. It's crazy at 90, he'll go out on the road. So we keep it pretty calm. So he stays in the trainer. Um, the, uh, he also takes a crap load of supplements. He's just one of those guys at 90 that sees an internet thing or, or sees a commercial about keep your mind sharp. I mean, it's not physical fitness stuff. It's not keep performing when you're 90. It's keep your brain sharp that he does. He falls for them all um, because he's fearful of it. You know, he's fearful of, of losing sharpness. Um, so, you know, he's, he's also taking – and he doesn't remember what he takes. I mean, if, if I called them today and said, what did you take yesterday? The answer right now would be nothing. But normally it would be, I, I think I took this. And he couldn't actually recall exactly what he was taking. He doesn't, at, at 90, he's just, you can imagine, right? I don't even need to explain it. You can imagine yeah. what you would. So he doesn't really know. So we took supplements that night. He drank three different types of protein style shakes. And then they... You know, and then he fails the next day. So USADA then picks this up. We didn't get a notice. In, and, and I think my overarching is USADA handled this at a very high level. They had their highest level people on this because they knew right from the get-go they had a PR nightmare yeah. in their hand. <laughs> um, you know, but what were they going to do to be – I think they were very professional and yeah. handled it well because they were stuck in a rock and a hard place given their druthers they would love to have not had to test carl and they would have loved to have let this one go away but i think they did the right integrity thing they had to deal with it in some way and they really looked deep with carl because carl also doesn't have any money to defend himself yeah yeah he's 90 and he's at the end of his economic ropes and so he couldn't afford to test supplements or do other things so you saw tested them they requested what he took, but it was five months later. He doesn't remember what he was taking the day before and let alone he didn't have. So he just gathered what he was taking and sent them samples and, you know, they found contaminated samples. Um, now, of 
you know, something different than what they found in his urine, which was, so they were just kind of pointing out the fact that this was an issue for him and it ended up making it in the press release. What didn't make it in the press release is it's also trace amounts. Right. Which would have helped to just have said that. Um, And then what they also could have put in the press release is what is the science of what happens to a 90 year old dude when he takes anabolic steroids? Right. Because anybody who does research says it's probably 80% likely to kill you within 24 hours. Wow. <laughs> because it affects your heart and yeah. blood pressure and all that stuff when you first right. do it. Yeah. But at his age, the death sentence, you know, do we really see a 90 year old guy sitting in his hotel room injecting bovine steroids? Right. You know? <laughs> and when one of the more harshest ones out there, you know, it's, and so what happens to Carl, you know, Here's my – when somebody asked me, friends asked me, here's my explanation. It's like tuna fishing, right? <laughs> and this is it sounds crazy, but it's exactly the good and the bad of USADA. Um, they catch dopers like tuna fishers that aren't you know, responsible. They cast a broad net and they catch a lot of tuna, but there's some dolphin in there. And in the end of the day, you know, the companies that fish like that and the people that eat that tuna, you're getting some dolphin. You know, and Carl's a dolphin. USADA and those groups have got to do their job. They cast a broad net. But every once in a while, a dolphin gets caught in there and, and they get victimized by that reality. So it's a difficult case and it elicited some varied responses on social media. A uh, number of people, you know, issuing disdain for USADA and the gall for, you know, wasting resources and money and testing nine year old athletes. You know, other people kind of poking fun at the whole story. Um, I, we had one uh, great note on Twitter that the benefits of this will last with Carl for a lifetime. Even Lance Armstrong weighing in on the discussion. But for me, it was just a really tricky PR situation for USADA and, and one that they had to handle delicately. That I, I really do think is the crux of the issue. So. Uh, Hats off to you, Sada, for not sweeping this under the rug, <laughs> because I'm sure the temptation could have been there. But uh, nobody wants to sanction a 90-year-old. I am. I can say with almost like near certainty that Usada does not want to have to come out and sanction a 90-year-old rider. Uh, it seems pretty self-evident that a 90-year-old who is still competing in a, the sport of cycling will probably be taking medications, supplements, uh, if you've ever uh, looked at your grandparents' pill drawer, you know, there's probably a lot of stuff in there. Uh, so I don't think that anyone's necessarily holding that against uh, the writer who tested positive. That being said, there is a precedent where if it's a professional cyclist who tests positive, even if it is a contaminated substance, they are going to serve a suspension because it's their responsibility to not put that contaminated supplement in their body. Of course, this is uh, really one of the issues with the supplement industry. The FDA doesn't certify everything, so they do not have to declare all the ingredients that are in the supplement. So if you are taking supplements as a competitive cyclist in any level, you have to be extremely careful of those. You you read about the contaminated supplement issue so much that yep. it kind of leads you to believe like, well, maybe these supplement, com- maybe contamination isn't the word we should be using. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I think that's very well said. Um, that is one of the bigger challenge. It's becoming the norm, meaning because of the low regulation, what I would really call no regulation, we do regulate claims when people complain. The FDA does regulate that, but they don't regulate production. Right. You know, you could take a vat that you just were producing bovine steroids in and then be like, okay, it's done. We don't need to clean it. Now let's just start making the uh, build strength for old people pills. Right. And throw it in the same vat, you know, and nobody cares because it's not regulated at that level. Personally, I think that the public warning is probably the lightest punishment that USADA could have given uh, given the circumstances. And I think that they made the right choice there. Yeah, I mean, from what we know about Carl, he is obviously a dedicated and very serious athlete and I think if the roles were reversed if he was competing against someone else who was taking something you know knowingly or unknowingly that was benefiting their performance 
I think he would want that athlete to be held accountable. And, you know, what we know about his response is that he is holding himself accountable for, you know, what was found in his body, what he was taking, you know, under com competition, under the rules of competition. He was afraid he cheated and he wanted to be a good example there that if you make a mistake, you have to own it. And that's the message people need to hear from. Here's a 90-year-old guy just trying to live out his life as an example who did make a mistake because he ate the wrong foods. He's putting stupid supplements in his body. I mean, he takes like 20, 30 supplements a day. It's crazy. Right, right. You know, and, and, and he got caught. And that's his mistake. He, when I first talked to him, he said, Tim, I got to tell you, you've warned me about this and I, I, I screwed up. And, you know, amateur testing, you, you know, there are cases like this where an athlete like Carl is unknowingly taking something and, you know, it's sort of a sad story and an unfortunate situation where, you know, his name is sort of uh, dragged through the mud for failing a test. But there are cases that we see all the time as well in amateur racing where guys, you know, are taking, uh, you know, steroids, other substances simply sadly to win amateur bike races and so i think at the end of the day at least for myself i am happy that there is amateur testing and that um if people aren't playing by the rules then they are being caught yeah and i also like to think that when i'm 90 years old i won't care what anybody thinks of me <laughs> and i do hope that uh this was an honest mistake as it seems to have been on carl's part and hopefully he is sleeping well at night yeah i, I think for me also the bit larger story i think for everybody is the sheer fact that a 90 year old is still not only competing at the highest level but competing at all so kudos to you carl and we will be back with another episode of ian friends soon thank you for joining